Get a Book Dot today presents Strike Battleship Argent, Book One in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2016. How many power armored Marines can we fit in a T Hawk? Lieutenant Colonel Moody looked up at Captain Hunter as if he had just asked about putting 12 men into a field goal formation. Well, there's room for a crew of five, sir. I. No, no. I want to pack them in. Shoulder to shoulder. How many can we cram in there? Maybe ten or so. Why a T-Hawk? Why not a Paladin? The heavies have deployment tethers for ground troops. Because I want that cruiser to think we're coming out there to shoot at them, not board them. You're flying out there wide open? Sir, we can lash up a nemesis and fly in cloaked. I don't want to fly in cloaked. I want to fly in there with a gun pointed at their head. I want them to be worrying about whether to shoot us with Argent backing us up with her big guns. Before we get out there, XO will go weapons active. By the time they get through their fight or flight hesitation, we'll be tapping on the window. That's an awfully big risk, Cap, Moo replied. Agreed, Colonel. If it pays off, we'll have that ship intact and under our command so fast they won't know what hit them. I'd take a bigger force if I were up against a true enemy vessel, but Dunkirk is friendly. Yili can flip a few switches and have us in control in a matter of seconds if we give her the chance. Dr. Doverly was busy reviving Zoni. It seemed the sedatives had done their job. Despite the pouty signals officer's protestations, she really had finally gotten some rest. Zoni, how are you feeling? She looked groggy. What? Doctor? Is everything okay? Hunter joined Doverly next to Zoni's bed. You look like hell, Lieutenant, he said. Zoni smiled weakly. Just give me a radio and a frequency, sir. That's good to hear we're lifting off in 15 minutes. Where to, Skipper? The Dunkirk is out there, and I want her captured. Even if we can't take the Admiral into custody, she's got technology we need to defeat that minefield. I'm taking you, the Colonel, and Yili with me. We're going to commandeer that vessel and drill a hole through that minefield so the Highlander Paladins can bomb the Sentinel emplacement. Are you sure we can do all that with one ship? I can't, but you and Yili can. Moo and I will be there with a marine boarding party to handle any overzealous enemy defenders. Hunter left the colonel and Zoni to contemplate his plans and stepped into the corridor outside sickbay with Anora. I'm leaving you in command of the Argent, XO. They're in no better shape than you are, Jason. Understood, but we may only get one shot at this. Just tell me they're patched up enough for an hour's worth of action. If I pump them full of stimulants and painkillers, barely. It'll have to do. Maintain CSP in position until we have the Dunkirk under our flag. Affirmative, we'll mind the store. Anything more from Atwell and the belligerents from Deck 34? The intruders are still under from the knockout gas. Atwell has been reclining on a slab of dense plastiform in his cell since his apprehension. Hasn't said a word. He knows what we need to know, Hunter muttered. He's going to tell me why Admiral Hughes is involved in all this and he's going to tell me what's aboard the Dunkirk before the launch. I admire your confidence, Captain, but he's not talking. He doesn't know we're about to take over his precious ship, Doctor, Hunter said as he stalked towards the brig. In fact, for all he knows, we already took it. Notify Flight 3. I want two Wildcats and a T-Hawk prepped for launch, and I want ten of the nastiest from Dogblock armored, powered, locked, and loaded in fifteen minutes. Acknowledged. Doverly watched as Hunter descended the ladder to Deck 8. Chapter 32 Another impact shook the records lab. Sparks showered and the backlit consoles flickered dangerously again. Commander Huggins ducked away as flashes of weapons fire strobed in the corridor outside. He was cradling a broken arm and holding an exhausted blaster pistol in his other hand. Eight hostiles! Maybe ten! Jace Hunter worked madly to stabilize the Constellation signals analyst. He was unconscious and bleeding from two catastrophic shrapnel wounds. The standard medikit from the lab's emergency supplies was useful. But Jace knew if he didn't get the attention of a trauma unit within the next 20 minutes, he wasn't going to make it. Tom lunged into the hall and sprayed rapid-fire plasma bolts in the general direction of their attackers. A secondary explosion caused the floor to lurch, and a wave of acrid smoke drifted back into the lab. The Fury's XO took the opportunity to drag one of the unconscious Marine Guards to safety. Lieutenant Sutherland was barely conscious. Her uniform had enormous chemical burns along one side. The advanced fabric narrowly saved her skin from being incinerated in the blast. 
We were pretty lucky, eh, ma'am? Hunter continued working furiously. Only because this room is packed with gear and consoles, Lieutenant. If that center unit hadn't been here, we'd all be strumming harps right now. Jace pulled out her handheld comm unit. If I give you this, do you think you can figure out why we're off the air? I'll do my best, ma'am. Outstanding! The commander handed the young signals officer the device and finished her work on the other wounded man. That will have to do until we can get a medical team down here. He doesn't look too good, ma'am, Amy said. In about 15 minutes, he's going to look a lot worse. Get us back on the air, Lieutenant. Jace slapped the woman's good shoulder to encourage her. Hunter moved quickly across the lab and retrieved the TK-40 rifle from the unconscious corporal she had threatened earlier. She put her hand to his forehead. Up to now, she hadn't been aware of just how young he was. She paused for a moment to think a good thought, and then she performed a quick field evaluation of his weapon. It was in perfect working order with a full charge. Now we can hit back, she thought. She joined her XO at the door. What's the situation out there? They've got heavy rifles and they're moving up along the reinforced corridor to the right and further down. Jace pulled the mechanical power lock on her weapon and let the connectors snap into place with a satisfying metallic thud. Range? Ten meters, maybe less. Perfect. Let's blow them a kiss. Jace Hunter suddenly appeared in the center of the besieged corridor and leveled the relatively large rifle at her hip. A flash of stark light reflected from the drifting smoke, launching a fast-moving bolt of energy down the corridor. A half-second later, Hunter detonated it with another shot, and a savage explosion twisted and battered the bulkheads up and down the passageway. Two shadowy forms slipped across the passage, drawing a barrage of rifle fire from Hunter. At least one of the attackers fired back, but the shots were wide and impacted against the ceiling. Jace pumped lance after blinding lance of white-hot energy into the floor and walls, causing debris to eject, splinter and scatter all over the corridor. Another figure appeared and hesitated in the open. In a split second, Hunter realized the attacker was readying another grenade. She fired another bolt down the hall just as a second attacker broke from cover. The detonation filled the hallway with fire. There was a scream, followed by a burst of weapons energy. A deafening, vicious second explosion from the dropped grenade ripped a hole in the station's internal atmosphere. One of the attackers ran headlong from the conflagration, his entire body in flames. Jace ducked to one side as more weapons fire followed shouts and the sound of falling machinery. In the ensuing confusion, Hunter managed to hit two more of the attackers with bursts of lethal plasma energy. The safety systems had long since been out of commission, so every shot that missed blew another cloud of hot, razor-sharp debris off the walls and ceilings. Hunter fired another extended burst, causing several more violent explosions, and then ducked back into the records lab. Having fun? Huggins asked. Always preferred a stand-up fight. Hunter exhaled, holding the rifle muzzle straight up as regulations required. Sutherland, tell me a happy story. We're being jammed. We don't have the power to punch through the local distortion field with this equipment. Fine, Hunter sighed. She pulled a second handheld comm unit out and tapped configuration codes into it. Let's see them jam this. What is that for? You've got two of those things? Yep. This one is a VLF ultra-wideband transmitter. Takes several seconds to send a data packet, but unless you've got a matter-slash-antimatter reactor powering your jamming equipment, you've got no chance of modulating the signal. Who are you calling? The world's smallest invasion force. Not far away, Commander Hunter's minibots were still in formation, headed up a well-lit but empty corridor towards the research side of the station. A little red heart-shaped indicator light on Echo's forward-facing chassis snapped on. It's AC! It's AC! She shouted. She says she's in trouble and she needs help. Let me at him! Rebel growled. He revved his drivetrain, but only managed to spin his tracks. You have to wait until you're on the ground, Rebel, Butterfly said in a bigger kid reminding little kid tone of voice. She carefully maneuvered along her flight path. Brothers and sisters, Wave began, as we prepare to take the field of battle, let us all remember though we be awesome individuals, we are also one, and as one, we will prevail. You know it, Lunar added. Don't be scared, Butterfly, I'll protect you, Echo shouted. I'll be okay. Butterfly was picking up residual weapons fire readings. AC sent me a battle plan. I'll share it with everybody, Echo said excitedly. That's the corridor, 
Wave said. Shaka, dudes and dudettes, let's carve the chop. To a spectator, what happened next would have looked for all the world like a 1950s monster film with little model trucks and tanks attacking a guy in a hairy rubber suit. Butterfly performed a textbook assault airlift maneuver, descending at maximum safe speed and placing Rebel in the center of the corridor. She detached and reeled in her magnetic harness as she pitched forward, using her main rotors to accelerate up the battlefield. Rebel's powerful quad drives kicked in and the chunky little tank rolled towards the action, climbing over small pieces of debris effortlessly. Wave pulled up along Rebel's right flank and collapsed his bay ramp. Echo's light bars began rotating red emergency lights as she backed down the ramp to the corridor floor. As soon as all four of her wheels were on the ground, she swerved to one side with a chirp of her tires and accelerated, following Butterfly's lead. Lunar banked into a position about six feet above Rebel and Wave. I've got targets! Establishing telemetry and battle space data link! Acknowledge! Rebel acknowledges. Wave acknowledges. Echo here, I read you Lunar. I see it, Lunar, Butterfly said. One of the intruders had fallen back to swap energy packs in his rifle. He saw the little vehicles first. As usual, there was a moment of hesitation and amusement as he saw a tank in the distance roughly the size of a thick encyclopedia, climbing slowly over a pile of broken conduits and rolling ponderously down the other side. That hesitation was what the minibots always counted on, as it gave them time to close range. Before he knew what was going on, a tiny helicopter burst from the drifting smoke and accelerated up the corridor right at his head. The shadowy intruder stumbled back as Butterfly whizzed past. By the time he had regained his feet, the sound of buzzing emergency horns, chattery sirens, and chirping alert signals filled the corridor. He looked down to find a lights rotating ambulance bumping into his ankles. Emergency! Emergency! Clear the road! Clear the road! Finally a 110, decibel compressor charge banger siren sounded, which was enough to drive the intruder back several yards. Echo accelerated down the hall, swerving around the wreckage of the battle, lights spinning. He turned and Lunar was hovering six inches from his nose. A targeting laser appeared right between the intruder's eyebrows. My name is Lunar, and you are my prisoner. You can tell me now, or we'll just pull the plans from the Dunkirk's memory banks. It's only a matter of time, Colonel. Give it up and tell me what's going on between you and Hughes. Atwell continued to stare at the ceiling. The only evidence the man was even alive was his open eyes. The brig cell's invisible force field hummed. What are you protecting at Raleo? That got the reaction Hunter presumed it might. Atwell turned his head and harumphed. You're so far behind at this point, Captain. Your only hope is to run for home and kiss your loved ones goodbye. What we discovered out there will change the very nature of reality itself. Your meaningless attempts to understand what is happening here do not concern us in the slightest. And who is us, Colonel? I see a lot of Skywatch ships. I see an interdiction formation, and I see a big gun with no power system hooked up yet. If I didn't know better... I'd start wondering if this isn't all an elaborate bluff just like your little toy. Atwell got to his feet silently and walked right up to the force field to stare Hunter down. You were warned. You were warned again. You chose to come here knowing full well things were not as they appeared. I tried to save you. The Admiral ordered me to save you. But you didn't listen. And now you and your crew are going to die. You speak of time, Captain. You have no idea how little of it you have left. If you're so certain of yourself, Colonel, then why the constant stream of riddles? Speak plainly for a change. What is going on at Raleo? Atwell hesitated, apparently believing he was going to be able to get Hunter to blink. Finally, he turned and went back to his mattressless bunk and sat down. The man looked exhausted, as if he hadn't slept in days. Perhaps he hadn't, but Hunter had to have answers. The Dunkirk detected a structure on the surface of Raleo 2. That planet is a ball of lava and thousand-degree rocks, Colonel. Any structure down there would melt into ashes in a matter of minutes no matter what it was made out of. The structure we found is 60 million years old. Hunter didn't answer right away. Then how... How indeed, Captain? When the obelisk was built, the Raleo system didn't exist. Are you getting the picture now? Are you willing to put aside your cowboy hat and six-shooter and allow your tiny mind to glimpse the true destiny of humanity? Let's say you're right, 
and the structure you found doesn't make any logical sense. What does that have to do with Admiral Hughes and the crew of the Dunkirk? Our first readings didn't make any sense. They weren't scientifically meaningful. They couldn't be explained by anyone aboard, even our archaeological team. But that was just our first attempt. After a series of experiments, we determined the laws of physics were breaking down the closer our instruments got to the obelisk. Finally, we managed to complete a molecular analysis of the planet's surface around the object and discovered five completely new elements. But that's not what made us take the next step. You sent people down there? Our scientists had to know. Even our non-technical command staff knew something huge was right under our feet. So we concocted a likely story and came back out here with our cargo bays filled with specialized equipment. We have observed the impossible, Captain. What happened next cannot be explained by any science known to man. What are we talking about here, Colonel? You found El Dorado? Another dimension? Gateways? What? Our astrophysicist calls it quantum reflection. It's as good a term as any because our best efforts to catalog and replicate our experiments have all failed. Every time we test the zone around the obelisk, we get another set of readings that have nothing to do with the previous set. None of it makes any sense. And all this data is on the Dunkirk? Atwell nodded wearily. One thing we did find is that isotopes don't decay here. They strengthen. So instead of going from unstable to stable in one direction, they go from unstable to more unstable in the other. Our theory is, there is something affecting matter and energy that causes quantum effects to form feedback loops that build up unstable energy. The only thing keeping it from ripping the planet to pieces is the effects lose energy the further they get from the obelisk. But that's not going to last. Why is that? Because the nature of these effects mean they build on each other, Captain. The longer that object stays in our space, the more powerful it gets. Eventually it will start to affect Raleo 2 itself, and then it will start affecting the Raleo primary. If it gets a hold of that star's energy, we theorize it will go hypercritical in a matter of hours. We have no idea what will happen next. Then why don't we just destroy it? Still thinking with your guns, eh, Captain? This is why we don't share important discoveries with average people. I took an oath, Colonel, and so did you. If that thing is a threat to human populations, I'm going to fly out there and punch its ticket. That's my duty as a Skywatch captain. You can't destroy it any more than we could. That thing would eat your weapons like candy and spit them right back at you. That's assuming whatever is on the other side of that obelisk doesn't simply kill you first. What do you mean, other side? We got a voice transmission before we called in reinforcements. The commanders of those ships have all been apprised of the possible dangers. We still haven't been able to translate it. The only thing our linguistics banks came up with was... There are apparently over a thousand voices in the message, all overlapping in the same data stream. There's an intelligence involved here? Far beyond our own, Captain. We could be facing an invasion, or any of a hundred other larger threats. Well, there's one certainty in all this, Colonel. The answers are aboard your ship, and one way or another, I'm going to get at them. Hunter started for the exit. Watch yourself, hotshot. Hunter paused at the exit as Atwell raised his voice. The Dunkirk was parked in orbit over that obelisk for days before we were able to evacuate the crew. Ne Hunter left the brig and hurried for the flight deck. We have no idea what's left aboard. Atwell's voice echoed throughout the detention section as Hunter climbed into the magneto lift. Chapter 34 New contact bearing 0 Mark 0. Collision alarm. The sudden shouts from the Fury's tactical officer startled everyone on the bridge. One moment everything was functioning smoothly, and the next, they were surrounded by screaming nightmares. Senior Lieutenant Sabrina Mallory swiveled in the bridge command chair. Reflex batteries forward! Fire! Point blank! A frigate-class vessel hurtled at full power towards the Fury's bridge, its engines glowing red-hot through their cowlings and hull plating. A moment later, the enormous strike cruiser's forward point defense weapons exploded to life filling space with a terrifying yellow-white fusillade. Sixty shots per second poured from each battery. The overloaded plasma energy produced a huge cloud of residual particles in the cubic mile of space forward of the Perseus flagship. Dozens of bolts ripped into the ablative nose armor of the smaller ship, tearing huge spinning chunks off and throwing them into space in its wake. Dust and electrical arcs formed an enormous static shockwave forward of the vessel, as its atmosphere ignited against the suddenly intense surface heat of the rapidly disintegrating hull structure. A 
A secondary explosion shook the ship's inner decks, but still it came, streaming atmosphere and burning debris. The boot of the gods impacted Fury's port armor, and the bridge crew fought to retain consciousness as the entire vessel pitched a good 35 degrees to starboard. The auto-alert systems activated and decompression alarms began to sound. What the hell was that? Mallory barked. Weapons fire port, someone shouted in response. Veer us off, pilot. All engines back full. Give me a port reversing turn. All battle screens to maximum power. Too late. For only a moment, the fireball trailing frigate filled the screen, and then another incredible blast plunged the Fury Bridge into complete darkness. Auto alarm! Fury's been hit! shouted the weapons officer on the bridge of DSS Spruance. I have weapons fire bearing 105! The mighty cruiser's captain calmly shifted into action. Sound fleet-wide general quarters, Ensign. Helm, bring us about. Course 77 Mark 15. All ahead one-half power. Comms, bring us up on the JA. Patch us in as 0 Juliet 4. Signal all ships. Code 00 Black. I say again, Code 00 Black. Engage battle conference on this channel and stand by for strike operations. The communications officer responded with precision efficiency as he performed five tasks at once. Affirmative, Captain. Coding your message. Encrypted LOS channels opened across space in all directions. The jangling clear channel alert tones sounded. All stations, this is Spruance Force Command on Emergency Channel. Acknowledge code 00 black and report alert status to signal station 0 Juliet 4. Standing by. Affirmative, Spruance, this is Revenge. Acknowledging strike alert at timeout 30 mark. Vessel at your command. Constellation acknowledges. Minstrel is at point five, station eight Juliet four, standing by. DSS Jefferson acknowledging, battle alert engaged. Rhode Island at your command, sir. Exeter acknowledges. DSS Ajax has the point, Spruance. Acknowledge battle stations code zero zero black, standing by. Comms, raise the fury as soon as you are able. Tactical, report all contacts. A chorus of eyes responded. One for each of the Spruance skipper's commands. Lieutenant Commander Francis Teller swiveled back to examine the main view screen. An atmosphere-fueled fire was burning on Fury's dorsal section just aft of the bridge. Teller's jaw tightened. He knew what that damage meant. CIC, I want an origin point and a firing solution for that weapon in ten seconds. The Perseus task force went from station-keeping to a perfectly choreographed swirl of motion all at once. Three destroyers and three frigates moved to screen their flagship from further weapons fire while the two heavier cruisers pounded away with their active scanners combing nearby space for the source of the weapons fire. New contact, 88 Mark 5, on a collision course with the Rhode Island. The tactical officer on the Spruance Bridge jumped to his feet. This doesn't make any sense. Where the hell are they coming from? This time, the command data net gave seven vessels a track on the suicide attacker all at once. The Exeter, Constellation, and Jefferson opened up first, firing hypervelocity point defense missiles from their efficient and deadly rotary mounts at the inbound target. Then the Rhode Island's energy batteries joined in. In a matter of seconds, 80 missiles were in space and screaming towards the attacking starship. Jamming signals managed to confound some of their their weapons locks, but did nothing to protect the attacker from DSS revenge. The Fury's escort cruiser calmly pivoted all four of her heavy weapons mounts to bear on the diving enemy frigate and opened up with a hurricane of proximity blasts. Ten megaton explosions shocked and pounded space for a thousand cubic miles around the inbound track of the wildly swerving vessel, as the point defense missiles began to impact. A savage storm of incredible destructive energy streamed through space and finally faded. There was no wreckage. CIC, talk to me, Teller shouted. I want to know who is shooting at us and I want to know now. I have an indeterminate series of targets at extreme range, sir, but I can't vouch for any of this data. Nothing on my screen makes any sense. Blasted, Ensign. I don't want to hear about your theories. Give me something to point my guns at. If they can target us, we can damn well target them. That's the problem, sir. We can't lock up any of this. Every time we match bearings, the waveform changes. The tactical officer wore a frantic expression. That's impossible, the pilot shouted. How the hell can a ship change its composition and EM signature? Incoming! The bridge of the Spruance buckled and shuddered as the lights flickered ominously. A thundering explosion rumbled through the huge vessel's interior decks. Overload your forward screens tactical, Teller shouted. The cruiser's shields glowed with excess energy. 
Another gigantic blast pounded the vessel's port side, and the bridge crew pulled themselves back upright in their shock harnesses. CIC, report. Sir, I can't give you what I don't have. Then give me a direction and range. Anything. Acknowledged, bridge. Our best guess is... New contact, 05 by 1. Range point 1, collision course. This time, Minstrel and Ajax banked in pursuit of the suicide ship. That's not a frigate this time, the Ajax signals officer warned. The angle is closing too fast. Veer off, Constellation. Veer off. The Minstrel angrily launched a full spread of track-on-signature ship-killer missiles. All 16 warheads managed an instant waveform lock on their target, but their overtake time was plus five impact. Too late to save their fleet mate. Kill that ship now! Teller shouted, jumping to his feet. A full-size war destroyer hurtled towards the evading constellation. Explosions bracketed her hull and debris started to trail. But destroying a ship this size was going to take time, and the range was closing too fast. Constellation! Evasive! Teller screamed. Out of nowhere, a full-power warshot speared the oncoming suicide destroyer amidships. A blinding explosion shook the very fabric of space as two more shots blasted hundred-foot breach points in the spinning vessel's disintegrating hull. DSS Fury's other two main batteries swiveled silently and opened fire. Shot 4 blasted the destroyer's engines into a cloud of spinning debris, fire, and trailing radiation. Shot 5 missed. Shot 6 detonated across her ventral hull, igniting a screaming shrapnel-ejecting hypernova before the seventh shot impaled her fusion assembly. An impossibly bright explosion flared to life briefly and then vanished, leaving a ghostly afterimage, a long trail of radioactive fuel, and an expanding wake of fast-moving debris. The scene on every Perseus bridge was the same. It wasn't often they got to see their flagship unload. When she did, it was a sobering event. Where a 70-000-ton vessel had once been, there wasn't a single piece of wreckage larger than a coffee can. Spruance, report! Come in, Spruance! Teller finally looked down from the scene of utter destruction on his bridge view screen and activated the intership. Good to hear a friendly voice, Fury. We have multiple targets on the board. Firing solutions are imminent. What is your status? We're hurt, but we're still in the fight. Transfer Force Command to 1 Juliet 4 and prepare to re-establish an attack posture. Acknowledge. Affirmative. Fury has the ball. Spruance shifting to Force Escort on 0 Juliet 4. Vessel at your command, ma'am. They're gone, sir. Teller turned back to his screen. The tactical officer was right. All their previous tracks were gone. There was nothing in space except the nine ships of the task force. What the hell am I looking at, Ensign? I don't know, sir. One second they were there. The next they were gone. Are you certain, Argent? Affirmative, Captain. They've been actively targeted for the last two minutes, 40 seconds. And no response at all? Negative. No change in aspect. No emissions. That ship is dead in space, Anora replied. Confirmed and rechecked, Captain. Shall we run a life signs check? Hunter sat at the pilot's controls aboard his gunship. T-Hawk 8 was parked 300 yards off the Dunkirk starboard quarter. At the navigator and tactical station sat Zoni and Yili. Behind them stood 11 armored marines. They were ready to commandeer the renegade Skywatch vessel and return it to fleet control. Go, Argent. Let's find out what we're dealing with here. Scanning. There's no running lights either, Skipper, Moo said. I don't think anyone's home. This fits in nicely with Atwell's story, Hunter muttered. I got the distinct impression Hughes marooned the crew somewhere. Perhaps they're on Barker's asteroid manning that ground station. Or maybe they're on Barker's asteroid as prisoners, Yili offered. With all due respect to the Admiral, it sounds like the man has gone right around the bend. T-Hawk 8, Argent. Go ahead, Exo. No life signs aboard the Dunkirk. Goodness, Zoni whispered. What did he do, kill the crew? Hunter blurted out. Moo winced. There are 170 men and women on that ship. Not anymore, Skipper, Honora replied. No life signs, no bodies, no nothing. That ship is completely abandoned. Does it have an atmosphere? Is life support functional? We've got signs that reserve power systems are operating at a greatly reduced power level. Mains are offline. No reactor signatures or heat signatures in her plants. No engine trail either. Sir? Hold on, Exo. Hunter muted the intership. 
What she just said doesn't make any sense. If all that is true, how did the Dunkirk get here? That, engineer, is a very good question, Hunter replied as he opened the channel to the Argent again. XO, keep us on scanners. We're going to board her as planned. Hunter out. Eh. The captain closed the channel and set the ship on auto approach. All right, let's suit up. Make sure we've got hatch clamps and everyone's weapons are charged and ready. Neek, take us to five meters. Engines at station keeping. Channels open. Affirmative, T-Hawk 8 on approach. The small company turned their equipment over and over, snapping, opening and closing the control mechanisms, checking and rechecking the indicator readouts. Hunter, Zoni, and Yili all donned their own power armor and pressurized their tack suits. Engage Triple S. There may not be an atmosphere over there, Hunter said. Affirmative. Watch your pressure and temperature differentials and don't touch any surfaces without your anti static and heat fields up. Any exposed metal over there could be 200 below zero. We don't want your gloves or precision surfaces to freeze and get stuck, Mu added. The Marines all nodded while Zoni worked through their comms checks. T-Hawk 8 to Argent. Boarding party in space. Meanwhile, on the bridge of the Argent, everyone's attention was riveted on the real-time video feeds from the boarding party's helmet-mounted cameras. It wasn't often a commanding officer led a spacewalk, and many of the younger crew members were in a combined state of utter shock and complete disbelief as they saw Jason Hunter float out the airlock of the gunship and maneuver his tack suit in the direction of the Dunkirk's much larger external hatch. Then the impossible happened. What did I just see? Honora said with an urgent tone in her voice. The rest of the bridge crew went back to their instruments, trying for all the world to decipher the data that would explain how the Dunkirk faded away and then reappeared. Report! Ma'am, these readings don't make any sense. One second she's there, the next she's gone. Argent to boarding party! Nothing happened. Commander Doverly whirled on her comms officer with a look that demanded answers. Channel is open, ma'am, and you are five by five. Doverly to Hunter, acknowledge. The Dunkirk faded and then reappeared again. This is impossible. Mass can't just vanish like this. The tactical officer exclaimed. It's like that ship is changing its atomic structure moment by moment. Are we in contact with the boarding party or not? We're transmitting. They must be hearing us. The young ensign switched her console over to a diagnostic cycle. Every indicator showed green. No fault in the equipment, ma'am. We're broadcasting in the clear on all frequencies. Jason. Meanwhile, Captain Hunter was confidently listening to Commander Doverly's calm advice on how to open the Dunkirk's external airlock. One by one, four Argent officers and ten Marines boarded the abandoned cruiser. Ten seconds later, the Dunkirk vanished from the Argent's instruments. This time, she didn't reappear. Jace Hunter heard a commotion outside the records lab. Weapons fire preceded the sounds of small engines and shouting, then a banging sound. She checked her weapon and leaned far enough into the mangled doorway to see what was going on. The intruders appeared to be engaged with an enemy behind them. Flashes of more weapons fire strobed in the hallway. A few seconds later, Echo came barreling up the corridor, emergency lights in full operation and sirens blaring. Butterfly was escorting her from a few feet overhead. AC! Acey, there's bad guys back there! Echo screamed through the door and skidded sideways to a halt. Butterfly arrived a moment later and pivoted in the air, apparently ready for more action. Are they hurt? Are they hurt? They're hurt! She exclaimed. Echo, we have to help them. Okay, Echo said, revving up alongside Lieutenant Sutherland. Cliver's first, Jay said. He had the worst injuries. We didn't have the equipment to stabilize him. Acknowledged, Echo said as she swerved around and parked by the wounded man's shoulder. Her wheels locked and she deployed her sensors over his face and chest. An indicator panel rose from her dorsal chassis and began to display the wounded officer's vital signs. A small clamp reached out and fastened itself around his arm. A pressure-operated intravenous system went into operation and began to restore blood volume, fresh plasma, and oxygen levels. Almost immediately his condition improved. Lieutenant Sutherland stared in blatant disbelief. She thought the words mobile trauma unit were just talk. But here she was, a robot with the apparent personality and voice of a girl not yet out of elementary school treating her wounded comrade like a veteran battlefield medic. Don't worry, he's going to be okay, Echo said, her little light bars still going. He's just tired because he got hurt. 
Sutherland couldn't help but smile. Echo sounded like she was on a weekend excursion to the park to fly kites. Butterfly had landed nearby and was busy monitoring the local area communications channels. Little indicator lights blinked all around the lower edge of her airframe. Our transmissions and reception are still being jammed, AC, she said. I can't hear Rebel, Wave, or Lunar. We've got to find that jamming unit, Hunter said. Until we put it out of commission, we'll never be able to reestablish communications with the Fury. What about the rest of the minibots? Huggins replied. They can't take on the entire enemy force alone. Can that VLF unit communicate with the task force net? Jace shook her head. Range is too short. We can get simple messages from one side of the station to another, but we don't have the power to transmit very far beyond that. Next time, we'll just have to remember to bring more army with us. That's affirmative, XO, Hunter said. But you know, there's still one thing we can try. She pulled out the VLF transmitter again. Butterfly, did you see any airlock facilities on Deck 5 on the way over here? Yes, ma'am, the little helicopter replied. Yeah, Echo agreed. There's an emergency one right by the corner at the end of that hall. Lunar, this is AC. Can you hear me? The progress bar on the unit moved gradually from one side of the screen to the other as the antenna converted the message to data and slowly transmitted it across the limited bandwidth available. Seconds passed. A light appeared on the unit and another progress bar crawled across. This is Lunar, standing by. Commander Hunter keyed her message into the unit manually, using Lunar's opcodes instead of his voice interface. After several dozen keystrokes, she hit the enable key and closed the channel. What's the plan, Skipper? I planted a message for the task force in Lunar's memory. He's going to open the airlock and fly it out to the Fury Courier style. Yay! Lunar gets to go to space! Echo cheered. I love it when he talks about going to space. Then all we have to do is hold out for reinforcements, Huggins said. And hope Rebel and Wave don't get vaporized in the meantime, Hunter replied. I want that ship found, Lieutenant. I don't care if it takes every fighter, gunship, and corvette we have. I want the Dunkirk located within the hour. Doverly out. Honora waited impatiently for the Magneto lift doors to open. There was one man aboard who could shed light on the events of the last 30 minutes and he just happened to be locked in the Argent's brig. When the lift doors opened, a detachment of marines was waiting. I'll put my hands around his neck and leave him just enough air to explain himself, Commander Doverly muttered. She marched towards the detention deck with the four heavily armed marines from Second Paladins trailing her path. She rounded the corner into the detention section. Sergeant, open brig A. Yes, ma'am. The duty sergeant keyed his identifier, and the heavy security door released its vapor seal and silently pivoted on its balanced magnetic hinges. The Argent's executive officer strode into the bay where the total prisoner population of one waited. All right, Colonel, it's time for answer. Atwell's cell was empty. Brittany Hawkins rounded the corner into the center deck passage on deck four of DSS Exeter at exactly the wrong moment, or exactly the right moment, depending on your side. The intruders had their backs turned. The lieutenant dove into a service junction and drew her weapon. She keyed her comm link and set it to intraship. Hawkins to bridge. Nothing. Hawkins to bridge, come in, emergency. Static. Jammed? Without time to make a plan, Hawkins peered out into the hallway, pulling her blaster weapon up by her ear. A sudden grasping weight slammed her against the bulkhead. She tried to turn under her attacker's hands, but she was off balance and stumbled out into the hall. Her weapon clattered to the deck just before a gloved clout spun her back against a locked hatch. At that moment, a marine PFC rounded the corner. Hey! Everyone looked up at once. The black-suited intruder and the marine grappled violently for a moment before the PFC was heaved back. Hawkins dove for her weapon. A blast of white-hot plasma energy impacted the bulkhead. Showers of sparks lit up the small hallway and junction just as the Marine regained his footing. The lights flickered. Intruders! Intru- A hard arm to the neck silenced the young Marine, but the sharp sound of his warning had carried. Three more men and one woman emerged from hatches on either side of the cross corridor and ran towards the disturbance. Finally, Hawkins gathered up her weapon and opened up on the large group of unidentified personnel at the opposite end of the center deck passage. She fired twice, hitting one in the leg and missing wide with her second shot. A burst of rapid-fire plasma answered, and she scrambled into the cross corridor. A voice shouted from further down the hall, 
Sound the deck alarm. Repel borders. All Exeter Marines acknowledge. Hawkins finally got to her feet and ran towards the small squad. The lights shifted red, and the ship-wide alert system began to sound. What have we got, ma'am? A young strike sergeant who couldn't have been older than twenty asked. Two dozen, armed. Not sure why they picked deck four or how they got aboard, but there you have it. Communications are... Hawkins' comlink beeped. Bridge! Get me the officer of the watch! Commander Pierce has the con. Report. Intruders, deck four! Exeter first marines engaging! Hawkins out! The sergeant pulled the bolt on his TK-40. What's the word, ma'am? Hawkins glared past the wide contusion on the left side of her face, still trying to catch her breath. Get those bastards off my ship, sergeant. The young marine hefted his shock rifle and grinned. Yes, ma'am. Lunar emerged from Survey Station 19's jamming field just in time to hear DSS Exeter's sit rep. Constellation and Minstrel were already veering in the chunky little destroyer's direction to provide screening and protection from any potentially hostile vessels. The Minibot's sensors did not have the range of the larger ships, but Lunar was able to verify there were no hostile contacts in his command area. For now. He added himself to the Perseus datanet and requested instructions from the Force Command battle computer. He was directed to establish contact with Exeter, relay his message, and then join Exeter's escort formation. So that's exactly what he did. Exeter's communications officer shouted over the overlapping orders and general urgency on the bridge. I have a priority message from Commander Task Force Perseus. There was near instant silence. Say again? It's from Commander Hunter. On screen, Pierce ordered. The comms officer switched displays, and Jace Hunter appeared on the Exeter's main viewer. This is Hunter on Survey Station 19. My minibots have engaged intruders near record storage. We have wounded. I need Exeter squads 2 and 4 and an emergency medical team to board this station and relieve our landing party immediately. All ships to battle stations, intruder protocols. I want a hard perimeter around Station 19 at 500 miles. Unidentified ships get one warning. Hunter out. The Exeter bridge went to work with the quiet, smooth efficiency Skywatch was known for. In a matter of moments, orders had been coded and received by the Exeter First Marines, and assault ships were powering up their engines. Attention unidentified personnel. This is Captain Uriah V. Cleghorn, DSS Exeter First Marines. You are hereby ordered to surrender your weapons and stand down. If you do not comply, we have orders to engage with lethal force. Acknowledge. Cleghorn was well aware of the fact that Jamming Field likely attenuated any possibility his message was received, but regulations required any Marine assault force approaching a friendly target to make at least one challenge. Twin boats from Exeter roared towards the cargo locks located in a ring around Survey Station 19's center section. They were relatively large egress points for the facility, designed to softlock most vessels in the 100, 000 ton, and up freighter classes. Each boat held 31 heavily armed marines in fully powered tack suits. The personnel bay shook and heaved as the assault boat twisted and banked in its evasive approach pattern. I need an escort to records, Lieutenant Hawkins announced. Hers was the only suit in the blue and silver colors of Skywatch fleet. All 30 of the other tack suits were decorated with the green and gold of the Skywatch marines. Hers was, of course, one of only three with an officer's insignia and transponder. We do this one by the numbers, Lieutenant, Cleghorn replied. We don't know what we're up against yet. I want to hit the deck with everyone squared away. Squad order, two by two, and you secure every hatch, corner and light switch from hell to breakfast. Is that understood, Marines? The platoon barked a hearty rah in unison. We need to secure the landing party first, Hawkins said. I think I know what's going on in there. Cleghorn turned to look back at the fleet officer. As you were, Hawkins, you may outrank every sergeant aboard Exeter, but this is my company, my command. You will follow my orders during this mission without question. Is that understood, Lieutenant? Hawkins was used to having the upper hand when interacting with Exeter Marines. There was a lot she was allowed to get away with around certain gunnery sergeants and enlisted. One, because she was his fiancée, and two, because for the last year or so, she always had the option to playfully pull rank. But here... 100 miles out from a potentially deadly firefight, there was one inescapable fact. A Marine captain outranked a fleet junior lieutenant, and Hawkins had now cashed in her one free screw-up. 
The look on Cleghorn's face told her further outbursts were unlikely to be tolerated. Yes, sir. Outstanding. Rollins, hand me that exterminator. A Marine Corporal who could have easily passed for a starting defensive lineman on any championship-caliber pro football team, reached up and dislodged an oversized shotgun from its wall mount and handed it to the captain. He inspected the weapon quickly and cocked it with a satisfying click-clack sound. Captain has the point! A rapid-fire series of communications was exchanged between the station's security systems and the two assault boats. The Exeter, of course, had all the necessary security overrides as it was a Skywatch ship attempting to re-establish contact with a Skywatch survey station. The docking systems aboard Station 19 authorized the approach of the two Marine shock platoons and set the bay doors to external control. The boats approached very quickly, only applying their counter thrusters at a range of 200 meters for final approach. They fast-locked into the station's approach control lanes, immediately overrode all the safety mechanisms and established magnetic contacts with the outside bay assemblies. Five seconds later, both ships had soft locks with the station's hull. The doors breached and twin platoons of power-armored marines poured into the cargo bay, weapons raised, sweeping the field of fire. Captain Cleghorn was first to touch the deck. Not a word was spoken. A group of ten streamed right. Another group rapidly covered the distance across the bay to the personnel hatches. Around them were various conveyor assemblies, overhead cranes, loaders, and pressurized containers. There was minimal light, but all of the Marines had fully equipped tack suits with independent helmet lights and a variety of range-finding options, including infrared, magnetic, and scatterband. Cleghorn caught movement in one corner of the largest open area and raised his weapon to advance. Exeter Marines, hands where I can see them! A tentative burst of weapons fire answered. The sound of energy ricochets echoed in the huge bay. Another burst blasted pieces of the floor in all directions. Cleghorn dove to one side and grunted when his back hit the containers he was now using for cover. Hostiles, look sharp! Light strobed as short bursts of energy fire were exchanged. Given the number of obstacles in the room, it wasn't surprising most of the shots hit inanimate objects rather than their targets. Cleghorn heard running footsteps and consulted his tactical map. Six targets bearing 310! He scrambled back to his feet and ran to a vantage point behind the barrier of pressure containers. He arrived at the corner of the stack at exactly the right moment. Hey! One of the intruders turned and pointed his weapon, but it was too late. Boom! The twin slugs from Cleghorn's rail-assisted shotgun blew a foot-wide hole in the intruder's torso. Click-clack! He reloaded and moved up to a more aggressive vantage point just in time for one of the load frames to explode in dozens of mangled metal pieces overhead. Another blast of energy streamed past. Rapid fire bolts sprayed across the open area in front of the captain. He waited patiently until the enemy power pack drained. Then he exploded from cover like a lawman in an old West Prairie town. Boom! A cry of pain echoed. Click, clack. Boom! Click, clack. Boom! The third intruder's startled shout faded quickly. Three shots, three neutralized intruders. Cleghorn marched forward, turning his weapon's barrel skyward and reaching into his bandolier for a slug pack. He reloaded. Click-clack. A moment later, another intruder emerged from cover with his weapon pointed the wrong way. He turned an instant too late. Boom! His left leg was vaporized by an exterminator slug. Click-clack. Boom! His gurgling scream was silenced. The flash of a much heavier weapon drove Cleghorn back into cover. The deck shook with explosions from overloaded concussion rounds. Second squad, report. Maximum of eight, sir. Retreating along a 215 and headed for the magneto lifts. Affirmative. Secure your position and stand by. Comms, what's the status on intrastation communications? Working on it, sir. Work faster, son. I want to know where the hell the commander is, and I want to know right now. After doing what he could to find his crew, Captain Hunter set about to analyzing the Dunkirk's communication systems. There was always an outside chance a full suite of communications equipment would be able to do what a tack suit based portable system couldn't. He had the power he needed. Yili did say the batteries were at 17%. After confirming this fact for himself, he set the ship's communications on maximum broadcast bandwidth and keyed the transmitter. Hunter to landing party, come in! He waited the regulation 10 seconds. Hunter to landing party, respond please. Nothing was audible on any of the ship's pickups, 
The captain quickly configured the system to broadcast his hail at 10-second intervals and set his personal comlink to relay the Dunkirk's response frequencies before moving to the short-range sensor station. Meanwhile, on the Dunkirk bridge, Zoni was working as fast as she was able to locate the captain's comlink designator. Anything? Mu asked. Zoni shook her head. The last autoresponse we got was from Lift 2, but these readings don't make any sense. It's almost as if... As if what? Okay, look at this. Zoni pulled up the frequency analysis track and superimposed it on the position tracking of Hunter's comlink. Here. Right when he steps into Lift 2, all of the frequency tracking spikes into third and fourth harmonics, and we lose his signal. Nine seconds later, we get the bass frequency and the harmonic at the same time index, giving our comlinks a chance to reacquire his signal for 0 .005 seconds. Then the bass signal disappears again and we lose his track. Now you could call this coincidence, except for that second blip. His appearance and disappearance is exactly coordinated with that bass signal. Meaning you can get a fix on his position? I already did. If I set our frequency cycle to his harmonic range, I reacquire his signal, but at a different time index. From our perspective, time is passing 100 times faster for him. I know that because the time index on his comlink is already registering a couple of days in the future. Could that be a systems malfunction? Mu asked, desperately trying to keep up with Zoni's formidable intellect. Not unless the laws of physics are different wherever he is. You said you had a fix on his position. Where? He's on the bridge of this ship. Mu just stared. As he worked furiously to get a fix on the Dunkirk's position, Captain Hunter's comlink beeped, indicating he had received a response to his hail. He keyed his transmitter. Hunter here. I see you simply won't be deterred, Captain. Hunter face froze in a combination of shock and recognition. He rose to his feet and activated the main viewer. The face of Admiral Hughes appeared. He was still wearing his Skywatch uniform but it was decorated with a number of strange insignia. He also had odd marks on his face. They looked as if they were from some kind of pigment. Admiral, I have orders to take you into custody and return you to Skywatch Fleet Command for debriefing. Hughes chuckled. By the book. I have to say I'm impressed, Jason. You took to your training much more readily than I first believed. I'll kindly ask that you address me by my proper rank, sir. Not in a mood for a reunion with your old teacher. Well, I suppose I deserve that. But I'm no longer a Skywatch Admiral, Captain. I have been offered a much more valuable role in the world to come. With all due respect, sir, what the hell are you talking about? The army that is preparing to conquer the core systems has granted me the title of Warlord. I will deliver the human race to our sovereign. He will decide if they live or die. If you live, it will be to serve the Aethys. If you die, be safe in the knowledge you gave your lives to advance a far more worthy species. You're already facing court-martial for a number of offenses, Admiral. Do you really want to add treason to your indictment? Captain, there is no jurisdiction known to man with the power to enforce its will on me. I have ten million warriors at my back, and a fleet of starships with enough firepower to annihilate the human race in a matter of weeks. We're not talking about a war here. We're talking about the complete obliteration of every planet man has ever set foot on. Stop it, Admiral. You're scaring me. You have an opportunity here, Jason. You have a chance to fulfill your commission in ways no other Skywatch captain has ever dreamed of. You can save mankind. You can literally save every man, woman, and child alive if you're intelligent enough to recognize where you stand in history. The Ithis Empire spans galaxies. Mankind is a mosquito infestation in comparison. Surely I don't have to remind the Admiral what mosquitoes can do to an arrogant population? Mankind never employed antimatter weapons against insects. Admiral, would you mind carrying a message to the Ithis Sovereign for me? It would certainly save us all a lot of time, and it might earn you some more paint for your face. Hughes's expression did not change. He replied with a deadpan, sarcastic tone. What message is that, Captain? You tell him if he plans to exterminate the human race, he better bring his lunch. Hunter out. The channel closed abruptly and Hunter went back to adjusting the Dunkirk's short-range sensors. A strange signal flickered on Zoni's frequency analysis display. Colonel, do we have sensor coordinates yet? Mu asked. Negative, but we're getting some kind of intermittent transmission on that base frequency. 
It's happening in microsecond length bursts, however, so there's barely enough time to register it's there, much less do an analysis on it. Auxiliary power restored, Yili announced. We can't move. You're aware of the inverse square law? Signal strength is inversely proportional to the distance from the source. Close enough, Colonel, Zoni smiled. It's theoretically exponentially true across dimensions. If the captain is on some other plane of existence, a movement of even a few inches could put him permanently out of range of any signal we can muster. Helmet station keeping engineer, Mu ordered. Colonel, we've got hostiles on the move, now on deck three and approaching the core magneto lifts, Yili announced. The marines at the bridge entrances braced themselves and hefted their weapons. Get a fix on him, lieutenant, now. The look on Mu's face left no room for interpretation. All due respect, sir. Even if we get the captain back into our dimension, what's our plan? Zoni asked. We're going to do what the captain originally planned. Use this ship to beat those damn bugs to a pulp. Captain on the bridge. Lieutenant Mallory relinquished Fury's center chair to Commander Hunter. Jace put a hand on Mallory's shoulder and the two women exchanged a moment's regard for one another. Then the lieutenant returned to her station. Hunter took her seat and swiveled to face the forward screen. Comms. Bring me up on the JA. Signal all ships. Task Force Perseus. Affirmative, Commander. The clear channel signal sounded from every comlink, intraship station, and signal receiver aboard nine starships simultaneously. Attention all stations. Attention all stations. This is Perseus Force Command on Priority Channel. Stand by for a message from the flag. The communications net quickly switched all receivers to green, and the Fury Signals officer nodded to Jace. This is Commander Hunter aboard the Fury. All vessels stand down from quarters. Maintain intruder protocols. Survey Station 19 has been secured. The task force will plot a course to Gitarn Sector 10 to relieve the starship Argent. Spruance has the point. All vessels report navigational readiness on signal buster. Flag out. <laughs> the comms officer closed the channel and switched communications nets to receive priority navigational computer signals. Helm, bring the fury about. New course 110 Mark 31. Stand by to engage the mains. Hi, ma'am. Helm responding. Mains at your command. A yeoman stepped up alongside Hunter's command chair. Ma'am, I have a request from one of the Exeter's signals officers for a moment. Have Tom handle it, Hunter replied as she examined a handheld tablet. I have dorsal hull damage to inspect. She says she has information on what the station intruders were looking for. Who has that information? Where? Lieutenant J.G. Brittany Hawkins, ma'am. She's waiting in the executive inboard cabin on deck three. Who the hell is Lieutenant J.G. Brittany Hawkins? Uh, ma'am, uh... She's the second watch signal. Belay the question, yeoman. Dismissed. The yeoman vanished in ways only yeoman who recognize an angry CO can. Mallory, you have the con. The Fury's third officer looked up in surprise as Hunter walked through the bridge entrance hatch, grumbling. Captain's off the bridge! <laughs>